Hello, my name is Simona Capizani. I'm an assistant professor of environmental philosophy here at the Department of Philosophy at Durham University. I look at philosophical issues related to climate change, climate justice, and other questions that arise in the context of environmental philosophy. And I'm here today with my colleague, Professor Simon James. Hello, my name is Simon James. I'm a professor of philosophy here at Durham, and I'm interested in the range of issues in environmental philosophy, environmental ethics, how we ought to behave in our dealings with the natural world, um, Buddhist environmental philosophy, questions that don't really fall under the heading of ethics at all, questions about what is nature, what does it mean to call the something's nature, and does anything qualify as natural in that sense? So Simon, how did you get interested in environmental philosophy to begin with? Well, I was, I was lucky enough to spend a childhood like climbing trees and like crawling under hedges and trying to find animals. And um, that led, on, led me to do biology as an undergraduate. And um, I enjoyed biology. I enjoyed the theoretical bits. I didn't enjoy the practical bits, counting snails and fruit flies. So I moved from like, the theoretical side of biology into well, philosophy of science and then environmental philosophy. And what does environmental philosophy mean to you? Or how, how do you understand or see the discipline? I think that's one of the great things about environmental philosophy is you've got this tremendous breadth you can focus on foundational questions in environmental economics or environmental politics. You can engage with the sciences or with, you know, the arts. And you can call it environmental philosophy, right? As an environmental philosopher, you're constantly dealing with work that people do in disciplines other than philosophy. I mean, have you found that in your own work? Yeah, no, I mean, I think things that I have found um, was that philosophy can act both as a toolkit. And so, I mean, from the beginning, I you know I have uh, memories of a middle school project where um, I had not learned about climate change yet, but I wanted to see if different temperatures affected butterflies' development. So somebody allowed my like ten year old self to put butterfly cocoons in the fridge and put them in ovens, and like this wouldn't pass an ethics board these days. So I'm a little horrified to think about it. But like there there were these deep curiosities um, about the ways in which systems worked together. And of course, those can be scientific questions. But as I realized that philosophy offered this host of different ways in which we can examine some of the underlying assumptions about how we think about the world, different ways in which we build values into our understanding about our politics and our policies, I realized not only does philosophy have a lot to ask, but also can provide a number of different kinds of um, really explicit points that people in the sciences and the social sciences yeah. can actually engage with. So I really found it as an entry point then into these different disciplines. And so now I find myself constantly trying to understand and to bridge these kinds of gaps between disciplines and, and to show kind of the way in which philosophy has a role to play in addressing some of the biggest problems that we see coming down the pipeline from biodiversity loss, climate crisis, and things like that. I think that's a great, great example of range, isn't it? So to do that kind of work, you've got to engage with economists and politicians and policymakers and scientists. Um, but I think also with philosophy, um, you also have the depth, don't you? I mean, with any environmental issue, if you just ask why a couple of times, right, then you come to philosophical issues, right? Um, I mean, there are lots of examples of this, aren't there? I mean, one example would be like conservation ethics. If you have um, the question of should you cull, I don't know, rats or rabbits or foxes in order to protect members of some endangered species. There you have a, a philosophical question, right? A clash of values, it seems. Uh, a clash between the need or the, the imperative to protect individual animals from harm and suffering and the need to preserve endangered species and maintain biodiversity. So thinking about that question, you very quickly come to the philosophical issues, I think. Right. Between values. Or even like an ecosystem as a whole. No, I mean, it's, it's really interesting you brought up conservation ethics in the context of even my climate migration issues. Yeah. So I'm working with some colleagues that work in conservation ethics and environmental philosophy more generally. And they've looked at some of the work that I've done in the context of human mobility and have identified that there's a lot to say here about non-human species mm. impacting. So with a shifting climate niche, you not only have animal species, but even plant species, trees, trying to migrate, albeit a lot more slowly. But what you then have is the potential for shifts in ecosystems. So does it make sense in our cons conservation practices to build in this idea 
that we need to preserve the ecosystem as it is? Is that just an arbitrary selection? How does that ecosystem have value? Is it merely an aesthetic preference? And so there's this really interesting work uh, in philosophy of immigration and that shows issues of xenophobia. Are we replicating some of those issues when we talk about even the notion of an invasive species versus a native species? So there's a lot of insight already there that you can find threads through. And then what kinds of obligations, right, do we have to allow for, for example, the boreal forest to continue to try to shift? Or are we supposed to be right, culling certain kinds of species as they move into different territories? How does this make sense in a shifting planetary system, right, under conditions of climate change? So, and, you know, I remember talking to scientists and they made the point that maybe our notions of ecosystems are like somewhat just aesthetic preferences. So I think yeah. philosophers have something to say, right, about some of these questions. Yeah, already you've got so much philosophy there, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that's a great example, I think, of how in environmental philosophy you're dealing with current issues, right? I mean, you, you very often we draw, well, always, right? We're always drawing on a rich debate that's been, uh, you know, that you have in the philosophical tradition extending back hundreds, maybe sometimes even thousands of years. But you're drawing on that debate and applying what you learn from it to current issues, to live issues. Um, we've got climate change is a great example, right? Because people are moving right now and, you know, animals are plants, their ranges are changing right now as a result of anthropogenic climate change. And it makes it a very exciting um, field to work in. Very. And I, I find it sometimes interesting because I think sometimes there are assumptions about what philosophy is and right, and we may be grounded in texts that are many, many years old. If you go beyond the Western tradition, much older, right, than is often assumed. And I think what's really interesting is, and especially in your work, when you, you're also doing Buddhist philosophy, you can draw from these kinds of traditions. But a lot of the work that we can do as philosophers are looking at and adapting to and addressing live problems. And um, like I said, I think it's a kind of world-facing uh, you know, endeavor to look at the different ways in which philosophical questions, like you were saying before, examining kind of the, the underlying uh, normative infrastructure, the, the moral frameworks that we're bringing to certain kinds of problems, they're not necessarily perhaps the correct ones. So we're trying in philosophy to figure out what kinds of questions we could be asking to address current problems um, and current challenges, and also to look at different areas that may not be assumed to be related and be able to bring those conversations in. So I find myself with so much to do all the time because <laughs> these challenges are so great and we need these kinds of, uh, you know, collaborative efforts. And so philosophy is just like the rich framework from which I can start to tap in and engage and build on that. So definitely not just grounded in very, very old text, though. I like that way of putting it, actually. So you've got the kind of, you've got the, the thousands of years, right? But not just in Europe, but in India and Africa and South America thousands of years of discussion which you kind of or hundreds of years of discussion at least but you're bringing to bear upon these live problems these live issues things that are happening right now yeah, exactly. so it's very it's, it's not kind of not just kind of intellectually satisfying it's also important like. right and bringing to light also um different kinds of intellectual traditions that have often been marginalized in this discussion so much in the way of indigenous philosophy indigenous climate philosophy and environmental philosophy has for years had arguments, decades, centuries, right? Um, been able to both generate systems for adaptation and resilience to address cases in which they have already faced apocalyptic um, circumstances. And oftentimes, you know, we see these problems as new, but in fact, many different um, populations are not experiencing these kinds of things as new problems. But what ends up happening is when you neglect these transitions or, or uh, traditions or even worse, right? Um, don't have them have a place of legitimacy in in the in the dialectics, in the zeitgeist, in the discipline. Um, you you are missing out on um, the kind of contribution and also the value within these kinds of traditions as well. So something I think environmental philosophy has done an increasingly better job at, I would imagine, is starting to um, acknowledge the ways in which the discipline itself has constructed itself as being exclusionary and has worked to try to um, address these issues and uh, and starting to open it up as well. So I found something very rich in that also political project in, in knowledge creation and, and examining how knowledge itself is constructed and the ways in which these uh, maybe exclusionary forms of knowledge construction then implicate the very ways in which we are addressing these kinds of problems and crises. So 
Thanks, Simona. Such a really interesting conversation. And um, I really enjoyed talking about environmental philosophy and more broadly, the environmental humanities with you.